God bless you. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day when we see the Lord face to face. It's not a, a fairy tale. It's not something we just preachers talk about and just preach about and study it about. He's a real person. He lives with inside of each and every heart of every believer. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited about the day when I'm going to see him face to face, eyeball to eyeball, and I'm going to bow at his feet uh, for at least a million years, and then I'm going to get up and look at him for about two million years, and then I'm going to get back down at his feet again for about three million years and worship him while the ages roll. And I appreciate knowing my Savior and loving him tonight. Psalms 127, Psalms 127, the Lord put these verses on my heart earlier today, and it seemed like that uh, all day long I've been studying on these verses about a year ago, maybe two years ago, at the church on Wednesday night Bible study, uh, I was teaching on the book of Psalms. And I just want to forewarn you, the Psalms are, is my, they, this, these books, or these Psalms, are my favorite Bible to me. I love the book of Psalms. And um, I found a lot of nourishment, a lot of strength, a lot of help in the Psalms. And uh, one preacher told me, Brother Darren, he said, I don't get anything out of the Psalms. And I said, well, I feel sorry for you, man. You ought to read a little more. And uh, the book of Psalms has been a great help to me uh, in my life and in my ministry. And I'd like to leave just five verses with you here tonight. And with your prayers, I'd like to preach the whole chapter of Psalms 127. And I know this is maybe rather unusual uh, for a revival message, but... God placed it on my heart, and I believe there's a reason for it, and I want to do my part here this week. So verse number one reads like this, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. I want to read one more verse out of the book of Acts, and we'll take our, our thought from Acts chapter 16, very familiar scripture, and I'd like to look in verse 33, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And I want to preach tonight on the subject, verse 33 says, he and all his. And I'd like to use those few words as the title of the message, He and all his. He and all his. Certainly this scripture that we write, uh, have read here that the writer is writing to us about is a family psalm. Uh, the psalmist, uh, some believe that, uh, believe this psalm was uh, written by David. I've read two or three different uh, ideas, and if you've got a Schofield Bible, the Schofield believes Solomon wrote Psalms 127 and 128. Some believe David, uh, but nevertheless, whoever the author is of Psalms 127 and 128 knew something about home and knew something about family, and also knew a little bit about government and about a city. And uh, and I believe David. Uh, David was a great man. There's no doubt about that. Solomon was a great man. But in this psalm, uh, this psalm is writing here uh, about the Lord's working within the family, within the city, and then within the national uh, arena of Jerusalem, or maybe Israel if you'll have it. So we find here in verse number 1 uh, that the psalmist says this, "...except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain." And all of you know that my trade is I'm a builder and a farmer by trade. And, and uh, I uh, went and got my little bit of education, designed houses, and it all plays 
hand in hand with what God has given me. They told me uh, uh, years ago, someone told me this, Brother Darren, they said, if you're born into the fuller family, you, uh, you, you're born with a saw in one hand, a hammer in the other, and for some of us, you're born with a Bible as well. And uh, we're full of builders and full of, of preachers. And, but I want to say that, uh, say in the outstart of this message tonight, uh, that building is something that we all take part in in our life. The church ought to grow. It ought to be better than what it was a few years ago, what it was uh, days gone by. The God's house ought to be growing, and God's people ought to be building every day that we live. And, uh, you know, I notice in a lot of people's prayer life, their skill of prayer is at, a, at an all-time low. You can tell when somebody uh, has a skill of using the tools of the trade. They can use a saw. They're not, they're not afraid of it. They're not, uh, I mean, they work fluently in what they uh, have, uh, have the tools uh, uh, in their hands. And they have a hammer. They're not afraid of it. They, but you can tell they've had skill in working with that hammer. I hired a boy a few years ago, a few weeks ago, uh, to help me around the farm, a young man of the church. And, and uh, he'd never been around farm life. He'd never been around anything of that nature. Brother Darren and I gave him a hammer. I said, I want you to hammer that, uh, uh, that post that we're putting barbed wire up and put that barbed wire a certain place. And poor fella, he didn't even know which end of the hammer to swing. And I didn't, didn't make fun of him. I said, give me that hammer, boy, and pull wire, all right? And, uh, but I want to say this today, that we're all builders, whether we realize it or not. Right now, you mothers are building a family, building a home. You fathers are building a way for your children to have something uh, for, uh, for when you're gone and dead and gone. The Scriptures tell us this, that we're to leave an inheritance for our children's children. And I like this today, that uh, I like to see families in generation two and three generations having something to leave behind for their families. And we don't see that a lot today. But it says in verse number 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. And I want to say that as we build the house that God gives us and the family that God gives us, our family will never work and prosper if the Lord is not number one in the home. Can I get an amen on that? I want to say there's a trinity uh, to the marriage life. There's the husband, there's the wife, and those two, they become one and then the third is the Lord there's the trinity there God if he is not number one in the home life your home will crumble I promise you that and I want to say this with all reverence and with all humility I come from a broken home you all know that and, uh, and I wish to God a thousand times over that I could go back to the days when I was a little boy and remember seeing the happy times around the home and seeing uh, uh, Les and I and uh, my little brother Weston there and having great time. But I want to say the home life today is what makes the church life. Did you hear me? If there's a happy home and God is in the midst of that home, the church will prosper and be what it needs to be. And I want you to notice also in verse number 1, the writer says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it, except the Lord keep the city. Now you and I, we, we can all agree on this. We're living uh, in the outskirts of Dahlonega and Gainesville and Cleveland just up the road and we we're, we're more or less country people. That's what we are. But I want to say every city is built on the foundation of homes and settlements being built together here and there. And the cities that prosper and grow and have a, a good name for them uh, has come from somebody that has plowed the roads, have taken saws and built houses and settled that land and did the hard work and laboring for uh, their family to prosper in that little area. And I want to say someone's tilled the row for you. Uh, someone's tilled the row for me. They've settled this community. Uh, to beat uh, the briars back and uh, beat the hedgerows back so you and I can worship like we do and what like we're doing tonight. And I want you to notice that uh, uh, the Lord, He's the one that established the family. He established the home and established uh, the home life. And I've said this many times 
at the church, if there's no better time uh, for the devil to work uh, in uh, uh, the families today than he's doing today, the scripture says this, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. I know the devil today, is on the, his agenda is to attack God's people. But you know where he's winning at? He's winning within the family life. He is separating mother and dad. He's taking children and scattering them here and scattering them there. They don't go to God's house. They don't hear the word of God. And I want to say this tonight. Thank God I was raised in a community where God's word was preached and where God was number one. Thank God if it wasn't for the Wahoo Baptist Church. And when I was a little boy, thank God in heaven, there's no telling where I'd ended up today. Uh, but for the grace of God, God came down, arrested my soul at a young age. And I say this today, thank God uh, that Daddy hung in there and took us to God's house. And there we sat on the minister of the gospel. And Brother Guy Lee didn't save. I feel heaven just talking about it. I mean, Guy Lee wasn't saving me. I, Brother Dean Bright didn't save me, uh, but thank God that night when God came by my way, uh, the Lord working on my soul and heart. Uh, listen, God, the Holy Ghost, uh, began to do a building in me and started working there. And I want to say tonight, as the Lord began to work, I started a building myself. And uh, thank God He saved me there, that wonderful, wonderful night. And I want to say, you want a good, happy home life? Let the Lord be number one in your home. We've got a lot of them say, well, I've got money, so what? I've got a fine house. I've got a fine car. It doesn't matter. If the Lord's not number one, you're not happy. I don't care what they tell you. I don't care what, what you think about uh, how you... Uh, how all your gifts and all your uh, pleasures are making you happy. True happiness, and I want to amen on this, true happiness comes from the Lord today. True joy comes from knowing Jesus and accept the Lord. Build the house. You labor in vain. I see people come to the church all the time. I had a young couple come to me, wanted some counseling at the church. I met them there and, and there I, uh, I saw them and I sat with them so we're about to split ways. We want you to pray for us. And I said, guys, I, I want to sit down. I'm going to talk to you. You ask me for counseling, and I'm going to tell it to you. And uh, they said, can you help our marriage? I, I said, you people don't go to church. Uh, uh, your kids are lost and undone. Uh, you've left God out of the picture. If you want your marriage life to be what it needs to be, get back in the church. Uh, and here's what their reply was. They said, well, we don't really have time, Pastor. Uh, and I said, well, don't you expect God to help you. Uh, don't you expect the preacher to help you until you let God be the Lord of your home life. Uh, you will be miserable and not have the blessings of God. This psalm says this, let the Lord build the house. Let the Lord build the house. They labor in, in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city. The watchman waketh but in vain. I remember I was telling Brother Darren this. Uh, that when I was right after I got saved, Brother Dean got uh, his uh, his family, uh, Brother Dewey Palmer there. And, uh, and how did you say that? It would have been your cousin. He'd be your second cousin. And uh, I remember the first time that I ever heard Dewey Palmer preach, a powerful preacher. And uh, up in White County, his name well known, pastored over Habersham County and all over the area, great man of God. There he was preaching one uh, morning service in revival. And I just had got saved and I would sitting under the old man of God and he was old then. And I sat on this side of the church of Wahoo and I was just 13 years of age. That man of God got up in the, the best of uh, his ability. He didn't get in a big way about preaching. But that night or that day uh, of the morning service, God, it's like there was a, a line from my heart to him as he was preaching the gospel. And you know what was happening there? God 
was feeding me through the man of God and uh, the fears that I had and the doubts even that I had even since I got saved it was like God was uh, I mean bolstering me up and giving me some strength and I wished a thousand times over I'd have run up to the old man of God and grabbed him up and give him a hug I did shake his hand after the service uh, about what God was doing for me in my heart uh, was this he was taking the fear out of my soul out of the fear out of my spirit and God was using the word of God and, and the city there uh, that God established me in at the Wahoo community around the Cleveland and Dahlonega and Gainesville uh, God began to work in my life uh, you have what you have today uh, because God has worked in this community in your lives and in your families today I study here that uh, that he that waketh and worries of the night, he's got bad problems. I mean, you can't sleep, you can't rest, you're troubled, you're anxious. Ring in your hand, you never can get any ease. I know a remedy for that. It's called the Lord. They say, Pastor, I have a hard time preaching. I can't get over. I have a hard time when you preach. It bothers me. Well, get your heart right. It's simple. Someone said, Brother Stephen Jones told me this the other day. His pa told me, so I just don't like, somebody came to him, so I just don't like the hard preaching. His reply was this, you'll learn to like it if you get your heart right. Notice he says, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, take the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Now I don't know about you, but since the day I got saved, I've been sleeping pretty good. I mean, he took the fear of death away. I remember, listen to me, children. When I was a little boy, lost and under conviction, and I'd lay a bed of the night and hear those Katie dids under conviction. It's like God was using them, preaching to me, saying, "You better get saved. You're going to go to hell." And I remember laying there the night, just begging God for some kind of relief. And I sat in a service just like we're at tonight. And here uh, uh, God was dealing with my heart. I was lost as a duck. And listen, God was convicting me. And my reply to God every time was this, I'll wait till I get home and get in the bed and then I'll call out on Him. And I don't know how many times I got down beside my bed and begged God to save me. But I couldn't get any relief from that when God was dealing with me that night. And I surrendered my all to Him as a 12-year-old boy. I didn't do it on my terms. I didn't do it uh, the way I thought heart to have been done, but thank God when I got in uh, of the altar and God was drawing me, then the work was done. I went home that night, Brother Darren, and I laid my head on the pillow and I said, Mr. Devil, I've given my heart and life to Jesus tonight. He's the Lord of my life. If I die tonight, it's going to be okay. I'll wake up in the portals of heaven and thank God evermore. I've been sleeping good ever since. And listen to me, it's vain for folks to lay awake and toss and turn at night when God is number one in your life he's leading in your family leading in your soul how then God intends for his children to sleep well not to worry about things happening going on around them the world could be crumbling you could lose everything you have but if God is leading you friend you'll rest good every night amen now there may be a few times you're sick but I want to say this, that you'll rest and you'll not worry about the hour of death. He says, it's vain for you to rise up early. Somebody that rises up too early is somebody that worries. Anxious to eat bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleeve. I want to, I want to show you something about the bread of sorrows. That's somebody that's always running, trying to make ends meet, and not eating enough, and that was me for many years. I started pastoring uh, 13 years ago and it's been the highlight of my life. I appreciate the work of the Lord. When I first started preaching, <clears throat> the week after I preached my first message, I lost 10 pounds. And then, uh, and then before the church called me, I lost 10 more pounds. I lost 20 pounds, went from 150 pounds to 130 pounds. And for 13 years, I fluctuated from 130 to 140 for 13 long years. And uh, someone said, man, you need to eat, son. I can out eat anybody here tonight. There ain't nobody here can can't out eat me. I promise you that. 
if you want to go after service and go get something to eat, we'll line up and we'll see who wins. And I want to say this tonight, that eating uh, is, is, uh, is part of life. But we ought not to eat in, in a hurry and say, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. What God has planned for you to eat and given you a meal. Listen, God wants you to sit down and not to be a glutton over it, but to enjoy that meal. And I got so bothered about it that uh, a, few, a few months back, I said, God, everybody at church was making fun of me about, uh, uh, about uh, how skinny I am and about how I need to gain weight. And I tell them the same story I'm telling you tonight. But I want to say this. I got on my knees about it. You can laugh if you want to. Uh, but I got on my knees. I said, God... Help me to enjoy what you've given me. To enjoy the home you've given me. The wife you've given me. The children you've given me. And I even went as far to say this. Help me to enjoy the food that you put in front of me. Ever how much it is, whether it be a little or whether it be a lot. Thank God I got on the scale. Uh, before I came to church tonight, thank God I weigh 143 pounds. Amen. <laughs> And then I stepped back on it ten minutes later. I weighed 141. I thought, well. <laughs> I'm going to say this tonight. When God gives you a meal to eat, don't run through it as the children are gathered around the home. Those are precious times, amen. Turn the TV off. Turn the television off or, or the internet off. Set your cell phones down. Those are special times. Your kids will be grown up before you can blink an eye. Just the other day, Eli was just born and now he's seven years old. Just the other day, Sarah was born and she's riding through the farm with me today telling me to do this and do that. I'm telling you, we're missing God's blessings. We're running too fast through life and we need to slow down and enjoy the blessings of God. I want to notice this. Uh, for he giveth his beloved sleep. And lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. And I know here tonight that a lot of you have to appreciate the children here tonight and I applaud you. Children are a blessing from God. They're not a torture. The other day, well, a few months back, we were up at the school. I appreciate Liberty Preach tonight. Somebody's been praying for me. And uh, thank God. They were having career day, and Gerald was up there, and I sat with Gerald. Well, he didn't want to sit with me, but I sat with him. We sat down side by side, and we was eating our meals together. He said, look here, picture. He pulled out his cell phone and started showing the picture of the grandkids. I mean, one after another, just grandkids. I said, yeah, that's good. He said, look what we made them over there. We got a big uh, playground or whatever it was. I said, that's nice. You know, I was trying to eat and enjoy my food. God gave me. And he was showing me all of his grandkids. But he had it right. And I had to go away thinking about it. That man loves his kids, loves his family. And lo, the children are a heritage of the Lord. In other words, when God gives you a child, it's yours to raise. It's yours to love. It's yours to nurture. Don't you set him in a corner somewhere or her in a corner. Tell the television, the baby, her or him when they're little. You spend time with them. Show them what it is to love God or to love God's Word. I'm telling you, we're losing our children because we're letting somebody else raise them. I want to say when God, when God is number one in the home, the children will take note of it and you'll even be blessed by your children. Amen. You know our churches are falling off. We're like the children of Israel was when they left Egypt, Egypt looking for Canaan. Mom and daddy had been through the good times. They crossed the Red Sea. They saw the blessings of God. They saw it all. They were witness to it. And they started having children there. They began to murmur and back back and said, Daddy, Mama, where's God going in our life? And uh, they struggled around there for 40 years. Uh, and their children want to go back to Egypt, want to go back to the old life. I want to say this today, when God is acting on behalf of mama's life and in daddy's life and, and he's doing miracles in their life, uh, uh, they'll see that and they'll say, I want the same God they've got. I, I want the same miracle worker they've got. Uh, I want to say when we lose God in the home, uh, you might as well shut the doors of the church. Uh, might as well quit coming. Uh, uh, but when God is number one in the home life uh, and God is number one in daddy, number one in mama, uh, and they're loving one another like they ought to, God will be number one in the home. Then we can have great churches. Can I give an amen? amen? Children are heritage. 
of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Now I want to say this. I know what it is. And my wife knows what it is to go through infertility. We tried for so many years to have kids. You talk about being broken. I mean broken. People coming up to me and saying, let's have kids left and right. Why can't you have them? And I was ready to knock their head off. I was. I was ready, not on my behalf, but on my wife's behalf. And every Sunday they have Mother's Day at the church is all my wife could do to muster up enough strength to come to the house of God. Wanting babies and wanting kids, I mean, worse than anything, we'd give our left arm for them. We'd sell everything we had for them. And I'll tell you what God did. We were uh, trying to have kids and we lived over in Cleveland at that time and, and we wanted them. We, we, it's not that we didn't want kids. Everybody said, you need to hurry up. And we, we wanted them. And I, my wife had, uh, had uh, major surgeries when she was a, a teenager. And I mean, just, I mean, scar tissue everywhere. We couldn't have, there's no way. And uh, we had a house over in Cleveland. Brother Dan, we was trying our best to sell that booger and get out of that and move back closer to the church where we are now. We tried for four years to sell that place. And God was setting up something in our life we didn't understand. I was down at my prayer grounds praying that uh, uh, one evening. I, I, uh, Jeannie was broken and I was broken. And she was praying upstairs and I was downstairs praying. And I, I cried out to God and all of a sudden God stopped the tears and said there's a little boy that needs a home somewhere and I didn't know where he was didn't know who he was I didn't know anything about it thank God I, uh, but God stopped me in my praying and in my spirit he said there's a little boy uh, that's going to need a home and just get ready is all I got uh, and I got up from my prayer grounds uh, and walked up to Jenny and she was crying uh, I said there's a little boy coming to our home you mark my words uh, uh, we never could sell our house uh, we put it on the market by ourselves in one week we sold it and to the penny what we needed to adopt Eli listen it came in one week's time Eli sitting in the palm of our hands through adoption thank God and God paid every bit of it after we paid the mortgage off paid all of our debts and it paid all of his adoption every bit of it and I want to say this that that child today has been one of the precious joys of my life someone said would you fight for him no, I, I die for that little booger. I, I love him to death. I, our children today are a blessing from God. I, if you've got a family I, and they love Jesus today, I, you ought to raise your hands to the holy heaven. I, you ought to be hanging off the ceiling tonight I, and say, look at the blessings of my life. I, look how God's blessed me. I, I'm telling you today, man, all in Baptist church, I, you're a blessed place. Look around. I'm preaching like an old man. I want to say, children are a heritage. They're the fruit of the womb. And, and then we go for ever how many years it was and doctors amazed and my wife walked in and said, you, you're a daddy. Little boys are way easier to raise. I'm telling you guys, little boys are easier to raise than little girls. They come out crying and they stop crying, yeah. And she wants, she wants, she gets it, and it's right then. <laughs> and God has looked down on our behalf and blessed us with a family. The fruit of the Lord of the womb is, is His reward. Somebody that lets God be number one, they want children. Let me say this about the Muslim religion. They want more children so they can take over the world. In India, there's people starving to death one right after another and cattle walking around all over the place starving to death and they won't feed the children back. Now, there's something wrong with that picture. Amen. And I, I'm, I may be backwards the way I believe about things, but I get hungry, I'm getting some feet. Walking around out in front of me. And little children walk around pooched out bellies not having no back flies all over them. And God blessed them with all those children they can't even take care of. A lot of them, they won't even take care of them. But it's a blessing from God. Did you know this? That right now, just a few weeks ago, and I don't, I don't know why God's led me to say this, 
but it might be for somebody here tonight. But when, when a few weeks ago, my, my cousin had his baby down at Northeast Georgia Medical Center, and while their baby was in the NICU, and it's fine now, they, there was three babies that got called in one day. The mothers had the children, left the babies there, walked out of the hospital, and now they're in defects or state custody. They saw three babies just in one day left by a mother because they didn't want the child. And I want to say that's a sad this that's a sad condition. That's not just in Atlanta. That's in Gainesville, Georgia. And I want to say uh, uh, when when we have lost uh, uh, the thrill of children in our home, the thrill of children in our churches today, friend, we have left the Lord. Amen. Listen, when, uh, uh, when the fruit of the womb is given and God gives you and, and blesses you with a baby, uh, you take that baby and you raise it from the day it was born until it's born and you love that thing. You show it, uh, show it God and uh, you live for God. Daddies, I want to charge you tonight by saying uh, always uh, be found guilty in front of your family reading your Bible. Amen. Uh, don't never be ashamed to read your Bible in front of your family. Never be ashamed to pray in front of them. I never or, uh, or neglect the family order uh, because that's where a family unit is one. Uh, and without God leading in that home life uh, and without God leading in that family, uh, you will crumble. You will fall. Uh, and your city of refuge uh, will go away. Uh, but thank God for a family order. Uh, and there's been a few times uh, uh, me and Jenny didn't know what to do. Uh, we win and win and worked and worked and worked and it seemed like nothing would fall into place and then little Eli would see us crying with tears and we'd get down in the altar me and Jenny together and gather Eli and Sarah around us and listen God will heard our prayers and Eli would say daddy God heard your prayer and he's answered look what we got now we neglect that we neglect everything I want you to notice that he considers children as arrows in the hand of a mighty man. I'm going to hurry. Now an arrow today, it takes skill to make an arrow. You've got to twist that thing around and around. You've got to work it. I believe America's raising a bunch of naughty children. There's a bunch of pine knots. Ain't no parents raising them, training them right. Come on now bringing in pistols and guns in school because they, I mean, they ain't got no, they, they's got no uh, decency about them. And children with no respect. You know what gets respect around the house of God? And you, you can like it or lump it, whatever you want to do, but a good old hickory tea goes a long way. Did you hear me today? Amen tonight. I didn't just get a whipping with a hickory tea. I got spanking the belts going up. I think I turned out pretty good. But I look back at Les and I think he could have done a little better. And I look at Weston and Weston, he never got the first spanking. But I want to say they, they, uh, they let him know that at early age, things he's so tender hearted. He, all daddy had to do is say, son, don't do that. And he'd break down crying like that. But I want to say the reason our nation is getting in the shape that it is is because mothers and dads have not trained up and sharpened some errors in their family. They've not spent some time going around and around that era and showing it and disciplining showing it right from wrong showing them that the word of God is right and showing them that the love of God is what they need and showing them that Calvary is a real was a real place and, and that Jesus is a real person I, I want to say uh, uh, to Mount Olive Church today uh, don't give up on the young people uh, love them uh, show them the love of God uh, work in their lives uh, uh, show them how uh, God's work miracles in your souls today uh, and how God is doing a work in your place, a business. How God's working in every whit of your life. I don't believe in beating a child, but I believe good old-fashioned training. Go a long, long way. It takes time to make an error. In the hands of a mighty man, and so are the children of the youth. Now, verse 4 tells us that we ought to have children when we're young. Of the youth. I'm hurrying. About done. He and his. He and all his. My kids aren't perfect. And by the way, neither are none of yours. 
I walked off. I had a hanky. I don't know what I did with it. I guess I'll wipe it with my... Eli acts up in church sometimes. Sarah acts up in church sometimes. Your kid's going to act up in church sometimes. Can I get a witness on that? Amen. <laughs> Train them while you're young. The other day, Dad come and got my, my two kids and all of Leslie's kids, except for little Leslie and the youngest one. And Dad and Nancy took them off to wherever they went. Dad pulled back up in the driveway. He's about 60-something year old. Fat fixed to be 60. His eyes was drooping and I said, Dad, you know why God gives young people kids? Because you just ain't got the strength to do it like you used to. <laughs> I want to say this to the young couples tonight. Be a mom and daddy before your career comes and takes hold of you. You only get one time to raise those kids. One chance. Don't you put money and dollars and houses and dreams in front of what God gives you. You can get another job. You can get another career. If it takes away from your family life, men, find another job and get back at home and love that family. Amen tonight. Your career today, you can get another one. And uh, there'll be another job. You don't have to have the money you think you've got to have. I used to think I had to make a certain amount of money or things would not be made. But through the recession, I've learned this. I can make it on a lot less. I'm just as happy with less than I am with much. And that's less to tend to. It's less to work for. Less to keep up. But if I miss out on my children, I have missed out on one of the greatest blessings of life. Children are precious to me. And then close in verse 5, he says, Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Notice this. Happiness is seeing those little babies run around your hand, or your feet, around the house. When you come into God's house, you can tell a man and a wife when they're happy at home, their children will be happy. That's right. When, when mom and daddy's happy, the children will be happy. When they come in with a sour attitude, they didn't learn that from just any old body. They learned it from mom and daddy. I want to say this, that happy is the man that had this quiver full of them. About 13 kids would be a quiver full. And I want to say this today, if God granted it and God could work another miracle in my wife and in us, we'd have as many as we could. But for some reason, God doesn't want us to have them. But I am content with what God has given me. I told them at the church one day, I said, if God gave me more children, I, I'd grow a bigger garden. I, I'd raise more cows. I'd build more houses. I'd do everything I could to raise them. I'd love them. And I'd feed them. And I'd let the church help me every bit. It doesn't take just a family to raise children. It takes a village to do it. And I want you to notice this, Mount Olive. You've got a great task around here. You've got all these kids running in and out here. It's not just mom and daddy raising them, but it's the whole church. Caleb and Melissa are fixing to have one. The whole church is going to help raise them. What you do and pray for these children, he and all his that God's given, that man, he's blessed, man, he's happy. He's got good children. But when the church gets in travail, are you hearing me tonight? Praying for that child that's even not even theirs, not their blood kin. And he starts praying for that one that They've watched grow up in this church that they'll get saved. They get to reap the benefits of seeing that child be saved and baptized and grow up in this church. Amen tonight. He and all his. I was privileged to be raised under men like Candler Brady, Ralph True Love, Sue Nix, Dean Bryan. I leave her London. Even Charles Bass in my teenage years. And I wouldn't give you 
the times I crawled up in their laps, his little boys, Brother Sue and Nick. No, no, nothing in the world to take that away. Go by. And the times you go up to Chandler Brady and Chandler just smiles. The first time we ever we took part in the foot washing. The old man, thank God he's still alive and he's barely getting around, not not too good. He got down at my feet. He said, I'd be honored if you'd let me wash your feet. I said, No, no. And I'm not going to do this. You're too great of a man. You're not going to wash my feet. He wiped tears away. He said, Please, I'd be honored. And I wept like a baby as that good man washed my feet. The times Dean and Guy and Guy still help me and Vernon. He'll help me. And I was raised around them in the church atmosphere and the family atmosphere. And they've raised me and they've got a quiver full of spiritual children. Paul said Timothy was his spiritual son. Titus was one of them. I tell, I talk, I, for some reason, every time I come to Mount Olive, I talk about Dean. I don't know why I do. And you people just get it out of me somehow. I don't know. Before Brother Dean died, he came, I went to go see him down at the home. He said, I'm leaving. And you boys better pick up the pace. I've done the best I could, could for you. That's what he said. I've raised you the best way I know how, and I've got a great papa willing, but I was around Dean more than I was papa growing up. Dean was my pastor for the majority of my life. And he looked at me eyeball to eyeball. He said, the chariot of God is fixing to come and pick me up. And you better get busy. Our family is what it is because God's ordained it. God's blessed it. The family was ordained before government, before the church, before anything, any other institution in the land. The family was ordained by God in the Garden of Eden. And from the family, we get the church. We get local government. We get the national government. And the reason our family is, a, is in a downward spiral today because the family is not doing its job. Amen tonight. Look at the strong families we've got around here. I was thinking about all the great people that come through this church. And some of them aren't here today. There's three or four generations that even here tonight, two or three, and some fixing to be born. And you know why people have been blessed like they have? Because of God. You've got what you've got because of God. And I want to close right here by saying this. If you neglect your family, you're shaking in your fist in the face of God and saying, I can do it on my own. Don't you be a statistic or a tragedy in life and say, I'm going to walk away when times get hard for my family. Don't you dare do that. You're going to miss out on some of the biggest blessings of your life. I have a family tonight because God has given me a family. You've got a family because God's given you a family. This family has helped me and my wife as a family. Y'all don't know that. And that's all I'm going to say about it. But this family has helped me to have a family. <laughs> and I've got a family. Because God gave them to me. It's my most prized possession. It's no stinking cattle on the side of the hill over there. It's not my little bit of real estate that God's given me. But my greatest treasure those two kids running around under my feet.
and thank God that treasure is something that I don't have to leave behind. He and all his. It's a treasure I can take home with me and go to heaven with me one day. <laughs> Why, Owen, you're a blessed man. Look how blessed you are. <laughs> the family he's got. And they're still being born. <laughs> Why, you don't realize. Look at the family God's given you and these kids. There's no doubt them's your kids. They look just like Ain't no, didn't your kids look just like you? Eli adopted another day. Somebody said, your son looks just like you. I said, I know it. <laughs> In way of imitation, I'm done. I want everybody that can that has been blessed with a family. Are you hearing me? If you hear me tonight, say amen. amen. To come to the altar tonight and pray a wall of prayer. This revival night, you can play a wall of prayer around these little boys and girls, around your grandkids over at Wahoo that you love so much, around my kids. They're on attack right now by the devil. If they, he could drag them down right now, he'd do it in a heartbeat. If I was you, I'd start praying right now for those little boys, those little girls. And I'd love and I'd be a church family. And then when they come to the age of accountability, it could be this week, that you get to see them burst into the family of God as we stand all over the house. I want us to get a song. I don't even know who's going to come play the piano. Brother Darren's going to come out here. And I want Darren to come stand right here side by side with me as the pastor of this good church. And you've got a spiritual leader around here tonight that loves the Lord. He's not just any man. He's God's man. And he's watching these kids. He's preaching to them. And he's a spiritual leader around this place. And I tell you, if there's ever a time when your preacher needs praying for a man, it's today. He needs the prayers of the people. Face off me when you get it now, Jeff.